On March the 15th, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a final report on recommendations made in November during China's third Universal Periodical Review. China's Vice Foreign Minister Le Yucheng, while attending the meeting, said China's great progress in human rights has been widely recognized. So how does China view its own progress in human rights development? Why does coverage in Western media often seem to present an anti-China balance? And how does the human rights record of the U.S. compare in 2018? To discuss these issues and more, I'm joined in the studio by Mr. Liu Huawen, Executive Director of the Center for Human Rights Studies, at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Mr. Victor Gaojikai, Vice President of the Center for China and Globalization, and Mr. Edward Lehman, Managing Director of the law firm Lehman Li and Xu. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Pan Deng. So, gentlemen, talking about human rights in China, let's start with this hotspot topic of the human rights situation in Xinjiang. Mr. Liu, what do you have to say about the Western media smear campaign for human rights situation in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region? Uh, I say uh, in this month the uh, uh, human rights is a very hot term because uh, the new session of Human Rights Council uh, 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 is taking place in Geneva. And um, uh, I, I see that uh, so many countries uh, acknowledge the uh, great progress achieved by China, and still and before, and uh, ch uh, China was uh, uh, criticized, was accused by uh, Western uh, delegations and uh, some uh, Western media. And uh, just as before, uh, Tibetan uh, people, or uh, Uyghur uh, people in uh, Xinjiang, uh, was mentioned again and again. I say um, we should uh, look at the reality, look at the situation there what detailedly. What is the reality? I say in China we combine human rights uh, realization together with uh, economic uh, development and uh, social progress. So uh, we pr try to promote uh, comprehensive development. So in Xinjiang we try to promote uh, capacity building of the local people. So this is a way to, to un uh, for anti-terrorism uh, and also to uh, promote uh, prosperity uh, of that area. So uh, the stability, the prosperity uh, of Xinjiang, we care a lot. So are you saying that China is trying to eradicate terrorism and extremism? It's not fighting uh, the formalities of uh, those isms alone, but by dealing with the root causes of extremism and uh, terrorism. Are you saying that? Uh, yes, and uh, that is a part of the reasons. Uh, so poverty is definitely one of the sure, root causes. E exactly. Sure. Yes, Mr. No, I mean, and, and I think that people don't understand that, that you know, this Xinjiang is the largest province of, the, of all the, the provinces in China. It's, it's so geographically large, and then you're dealing with a, with a border region which can be tumultuous just because it's a border region as well. Then you've got the ethnic minorities. And so I think if you take, if you take anything under a microscope, it, it's un, a little bit unfair to do that. So you're, they're trying to combine bringing 700 million people out of poverty, which is what China's goal has been to eradicate uh, a whole bunch by 2020, um, another 30 million by 2020. It, it, so the number is uh, absolutely astonishing. At the same time, you have to have national defense, you have to have a government that works, and you have to have an economy that is able to be viable enough to put people to work. In the West, it's been difficult. So the One Belt, One Road is an, is an initiative. Sure, there's going to be security issues with regards to that, but those same security issues we see in the United States at airports when you land in Newark with regards to security, the same types of things that they have in Xinjiang. Mm. Um, you know, the group, the UNHCR has been criticized, this group of 47, this uh, country, uh, I mean, of the 47 different countries that are represented, has been criticized as uh, kind of calling it unfair. Uh, and, and it's easy to do. I mean, we have Guantanamo Bay in the United States, for example. I mean, in Cuba, but we have them outside of the United States. And so different types of things can happen there outside of the borders of our country. One can call that unfair as well. So it's very difficult, I think, to, uh, to generalize with regards to this issue. So, uh, Victor, can we say that uh, providing people a better livelihood and getting them out of poverty is also 
an integration process into the mainstream society, the big family of the Chinese nation, as we usually say? Well, first of all, human rights are very important. It's important for China, important for China, Xinjiang province, as it is important for all the other countries in the world. Secondly, human rights are evolving. It's not carved in stone. And uh, we may have some problem, but we need to deal with them. And thirdly, I think different countries sometimes have different definitions or understanding as to what exactly constitutes human rights. For example, in the United States, uh, people have a constitutional right to bear arms. Do you call it human rights? No. In China, for example, as in many other countries, we don't consider that as part of human rights. We think that's something that the government really need to do something about. Uh, widespread ownership of guns is one of the reasons why so many people, so many innocent lives are lost in the United States. And here in China, I think we very much put a premium on maintaining political stability, keeping peace, for example, and fighting against terrorism, separatism, and uh, extremism. And this is exactly one key challenge in Xinjiang. Uh, I think Ed is uh, absolutely right. Xinjiang is bothering with several countries, including Afghanistan, and there is widespread infiltration of terrorism and extremism from some of these countries into Xinjiang. It is for the record that there are Uyghur fighters not only fighting the American soldiers and NATO soldiers in Afghanistan, but also in Syria, for example, fighting on behalf of ISIS. And I think they also bring back infiltrations uh, and other extreme ideas to the local communities. I think the Chinese government is mobilizing all the resources possible to fight against terrorism, extremism, and separatism. And I think the rest of the world need to really understand this is the driving force here in Xinjiang. And I think in the last uh, past two years, there has been no sudden outbreak of extreme terrorist activities. And we are very grateful. People feel safer now, mm -hmm. not only in China as a, as a whole, but especially in Xinjiang. Right, so back to the question you just uh, raised. What is the definition of your human rights uh, from China's political and social economic condition? I would say in China we view human rights as a structure, uh, at a very, very important foundational level. People need to have expectation of safety. Their life should be free from imminent threat, for example. They should not expect to go out in the street and get shot, for example. And they should also have a steady job, well-paying job, for example. They should have the right to send their kids to school. When they get sick, for example, they need to get minimum and decent medical insurance, for example. So in China, we put a lot of emphasis on the quality of life, for example. Of course, political human rights are also important. But then, between countries, it really varies a great deal, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, allow me a minute to talk about Switzerland, for example. We all know Switzerland has a very high level of human rights and democracy. But the Swiss people normally get referenda very, very frequently. Mm -hmm. It's part of their human rights. It's part of their democracy. But do you think a big country like the United States can conduct a referendum like that mm -hmm. on major issues? No. No, the British did one referendum on Brexit and the whole country is paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And they are still uh, uh, dealing with the consequences of that. They are still not out of the woods on that. So I would say we need to really look at the substance rather than the formalities of human rights or democracy. Sure. I mean, so, it, yes. Oh, yes but, but, uh, yeah. I mean, just to follow on what Victor was saying, which is the, the exactly right. In 1966, they, they outlaid what is, what are the, what's the Declaration of Human Rights. Even the United States, in a case called uh, Sosa versus Alvarez McCain, mm. uh, rejected this idea of the Declaration of Human Rights and International Law uh, being uh, perpetrated on the United States, for example. So the Supreme Court has rejected that under the Rehnquist uh, decision. And so it's very disingenuous for other nations to take a look see and so there isn't really the standard form exactly as victor had said what it, you know in some places the european union health uh, care uh, given would be considered a human right and now this discussion of the 2020 run up to the election in the united states they're suggesting things like that as well. So the definition is a movable feast on what what are human rights and one 
it has to be uh, very careful when they say that China is, is not acting in, in good faith with regards to that region. Mm -hmm. It's a complex region, like uh, Victor was saying, with regards to Afghanistan, with regards to the other stands, these other nations that they border on, and the, uh, the areas there with the ethnic tensions uh, are enough that one has to institute for national security and safety, these types of things. And so if you look at it in a different way, you can say, well, this is not fair. But w if you're actually there, then it makes sense, I think. And uh, Mr. Liu, do you think in the face of glo global discourse, which is largely dominated by Western media, China has to deal with this problem of double standard? On human rights. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's a uh, fact. It's the reality. And uh, last year, uh, we uh, there are so many events uh, to uh, celebrate uh, the 70 years anniversary of the UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Mm. That means we have uh, globally uh, common goals, mm. uh, but. Uh, 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 actually, uh, for different countries, we have uh, uh, to find uh, the uh, specific ways uh, to improve human the rights. Specific uh, interpretation, right? Yes, mm. yes. So detailedly, uh, and also I see uh, uh, all rules uh, uh, lead to Rome. So we have to find the the suitable uh, methods, the suitable ways uh, to. Yeah, uh, but improve. for China, how? Uh, I see. Uh, my understanding is uh, we use a uh, uh, holistic approach. Uh, that means uh, uh, we do not see whether there is human rights or not. Uh, always we see uh, ac according to our basis, our uh, conditions, uh, uh, whether we uh, develop human rights fully. So we combine we combine uh, human rights uh, uh, realization together with uh, economic development and social progress. Mm. So let's narrow down that scope you just raised a mm. little bit. Mm. Is this uh, uh, a choice between collectivism and individualism. Can we say that? Uh, I see. Uh, yes, there are different uh, emphases and uh, different uh, features of the uh, of the cultures. Uh, however, still uh, uh, our understanding of human rights uh, uh, cover both uh, individuals, uh, individual values and collective mm -hmm. uh, 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 values. Yeah. What's your take on this, Victor? No, I think uh, uh, human rights uh, include the right to happiness. Uh, happiness is at least uh, very substantially based on economic development. Mm -hmm. So if you are in a country where economic uh, development is really in shambles, for example, where people cannot really make their ends meet, then their happiness or their pursuit of happiness will be very much hindered. And I would say the full realization of their human rights will not be possible when you really make it so difficult for people to make their ends meet. So I think in China, yes, indeed, the government, is, especially over the past four decades, has put so much an emphasis on economic development, improving the living standards of the people, bringing people out of poverty, for example, and now promoting globalization so that the benefits of economic growth can be shared not only by people here in China but in many other parts of the world. And I think from the Chinese perspective this is very much a core part of human rights. Well gentlemen we'll be continuing this right after this. You're watching Dialogue on CGTN. Stay with us. Well gentlemen uh, China is widely considered as a country with a plan, and it's usually a long-term plan. So let's, Mr. Liu, let's talk about this National Human Rights Action Plan. It was first raised in 2009, and up to now, three National Human Rights Action Plans have been developed, and in particular, the last national plan even synchronized with a five-year plan for economic and social uh, development. Why China uh, do this? Yeah, it's just uh, in, re in re uh, response to the uh, uh, calling of the UN. Uh, in 1993, uh, uh, the, uh, the UN adopted a document uh, to uh, call on the member states to uh, adopt and implement uh, human rights action plans to promote uh, human rights. Uh, now, today, uh, about uh, 30 uh, countries uh, uh, 
drafted uh, uh, human rights action plans uh, uh, three times. Uh, so China is uh, 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 using uh, these uh, this methods. It's not uh, uh, our traditional way, and actually it's, uh, it's uh, the, uh, the methods uh, 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 requested by, by the UN, but mm. uh, many Western countries, they do, they do not do this. Uh, uh, personally, I think it's quite important. I know that uh, uh, different uh, governmental uh, organizations, uh, their work uh, is uh, uh, about is concerning human rights, but uh, with this plan, action plan is for human rights on purpose. So uh, uh, the, the action plans actually uh, stipulate uh, the, the, uh, the tasks, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the details uh, uh, for the different uh, government organizations uh, to, to do. Uh, and I say it's very conducive. So you're saying that it, it's a plan with teeth. That that is something for governments at different levels that they must do, not yes, you know, they yes, are yes. willing or not. It's not yeah. about willing or not. It's a must, right? Yes, yes. Mm. And uh, uh, there is a midterm and uh, and uh, the whole term uh, uh, monitoring uh, evaluation uh, uh, procedure. Mm. Uh, at the last, uh, there will be assessment report uh, adopted uh, by the interministerial uh, uh, meeting. Mm. What about the UN 2030 uh, Sustainable Development uh, Plan? Because uh, one big push by China is that it will eliminate poverty in the country in, uh, to be honest, next year, the year 2020, mm. 10 years ahead of that UN goal. Do you think that could also be a part? Uh, of China's push to global human rights development. Yeah, China attached a lot of significance to poverty reduction. And uh, uh, in this sense, we are the, the pioneer uh, country to implement uh, the UN uh, 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Agenda. So, uh, Mr. Lehman, earlier we, we talked a little bit about the criticism faced by China on its human rights record. Uh, mm. Do you think it's due to misunderstanding or China's own publicity on its human rights uh, also needs to be improved? You know, I think its publicity certainly needs to be improved. I think that, again, if you take the United States, for example, you know, we as a nation rounded up all Japanese Americans or Japanese that were in the country at the time and uh, put them in, in camps, for example. And it was uh, FDR's decision. Right, that's right. It, it was also supported by uh, Chief Justice Warren, who would later mm. become Chief Justice Warren, who was right. the head of the <laughs> California court at that time. And then later, um, so we've had instances in the United States that are very well known where we've made these these national security decisions, whether they were right or wrong, and in retrospect, it seems very bad and very wrong. At the time, it was it was welcomed as something that was was supposed to keep the country safe. So you you had the similar situation with the Western press trying to judge uh, Switzerland as the same level as China with regards to human rights and with regards to security and everything else. And these are just not the same thing. You're trying to govern one point. 4 billion people, you're trying to govern this very large uh, group of people that are, are uh, operating in a very large province, and so you have to institute different measures, and I, and I think it's largely misread by the press. So I think part of it is the One Belt, One Road is going to get more people and more economics there. I believe that it's all a little bit like Maslow's theory of hierarchy, which is of needs, which is one, you have to have the food and shelter for people mm. and safety, and then finally you're getting to the attainment of of human rights or love or whatever that might be self-understanding. Uh, and so I don't think we're quite there yet with regards to Xinjiang. And I think that we're getting there, but we can only get there with, with, the, with the help of economics. And that's what the government has laid out a blueprint for. So you, you've been traveling across yeah. the Pacific yeah. often. So uh, from the momentum uh, you've been getting from both sides, what are the specific points or areas that China can improve in terms of publicity? Well, I think, you know, I think what, what they're having problems with is, is, again, the Western media. This is the same problem that Mr. Trump is having with Western media at the time, too, which is the so-called fake news. And so mm. if, you, if you take anything out of context, it, it, looks, it looks awful and it looks bad. I think that there, there's too much drilling down now on, on what is safety and national security versus what is... Um, what is, is, is uh, censorship of or, or, or trying to militarize the area. So I think that the, the words that are being used by Western press is really insightful and not helpful with regards to the, the situation on the ground. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that by this media and other medias that are promoted by, the, by China, it can help to get the word out. Also to get more media there to take a look-see at the ground that, you know, it's mm. not what it, all the terrible thing that it is. Mm. Having said that, the U.S. government could be called the biggest critic 
of China's human right, uh, rights records, and it's been doing this constantly. Uh, Victor, what's in it for the U.S. government to do so? No, I think uh, uh, no country in the world, I would say, has a perfect record in human rights. There are always problems, very degrees of problems, and every country, including China, can further improve our human rights record. For the United States, it's the same case. I think the United States really should avoid using human rights as a political instrument to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries because otherwise other countries can do the same thing as the United States is doing to other countries and now the Chinese government actually publishes a report mm. about the human rights record in the United States so people can really look at the two documents and compare now the Chinese uh, pointing out of the human rights problems in the United States are very real and very objective observations of the real problems in the streets, in the families, for example, in the uh, communities in the United States. And therefore, I think self-reflection is more of a quality here. And when you point a uh, accusing finger at any other country, you need to really get your own house in order first. Mm. And uh, uh, Mr. Liu, what, what do you make of uh, the practice of publishing human rights uh, reports on other countries started by the United States and now China, as Victor just mentioned, publishes uh, its own report on U.S. records? Yes, it's uh, for a long time, uh, since uh, uh, end of the 1970s, uh, uh, the U.S. began its uh, uh, human rights diplomacy. And uh, during this, for this, uh, they uh, uh, published uh, state uh, 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 states uh, human rights reports uh, uh, annually and uh, so for China we have to respond so always uh, we follow that mm. uh, we, we, we never initiate the, the process mm. so we have to clarify mm. and uh, we have to expose what is the reality what is the problem mm. the problem is uh, uh, inside uh, 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 U.S. Uh, their uh, human rights uh, uh, problem as well, and outside uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, in the international society, uh, the U.S. is playing uh, negative role, uh, and uh, uh, some uh, the activities are quite uh, not conducive mm -hmm. to human rights. What about another gesture? Because <coughs> the U.S. Has, uh, has withdrawn from uh, the U.N. human rights. Council and by citing the reason uh, it is becoming a cesspool of uh, political bias. What do you make of uh, this re reason uh, raised by the US? Yeah, it's quite symbolic actually. I see it seems that for a long time the US cares human rights a lot. Uh, however, uh, now Human Rights Council of the UN is the most important uh, uh, multilateralist uh, uh, platform but uh, the biggest, uh, the largest uh, developed country with, withdrew from uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this council. So that means uh, it, the U.S. itself decide, itself uh, 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 decide what to do. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So how would you characterize uh, the U.N. Human Rights Council? Is it a platform for cooperation or it, it plays as an impartial uh, observer or practitioner of human rights protection and development, how, how would you define this? Um, uh, during the past uh, years, uh, uh, there are three pillars for the UN reform and the UN development. Uh, uh, the three pillars are uh, security, development, and human rights. Uh, because of this, uh, uh, in the year 2006, uh, the Human Rights Council was established. Uh, and this is the most uh, important uh, organ uh, under the United Nations. Uh, it's the uh, multilateral platform for exchanges, uh, for uh, dialogues, uh, and uh, also to uh, monitor the human rights situation around the world. Right. But yes, yes, but Edward. Yeah, just one thing to, to follow up on is that what's in it for the U.S., and I'll tell you where this, I believe, it all began, which is, which is really special interest groups and lobbyists. I mean, they were the ones in the, the, their, that have a reason to an axe to grind with China. So it would be unions, for example, with labor moving, abroad, moving things abroad. It would be disgruntled people with the, with the China situation, with, with the larger China uh, you know, congressional approach. And so I believe that they use human rights as this club that they would like to beat up China with from time to time. And they then use the media to be able to institute that by, by paying money to these people uh, mm. on the media to be able to cover these types of things. Mm. So I think it's stoked 
stoked by personal interests and special interests mostly, and that you know China needs to adapt the same measures by hiring these public relations and lobby groups in, in the United States to get the message out for themselves as well. Right, Victor. Now let's take a look at the big picture. China is the largest developing country in the world. So in a whole, what are the most daunting challenges in human rights development for developing countries, and what kind of experience that China uh, can share? No, I think uh, the right to development, the right to a better life, for example, education, schooling, safety, security, these are all common in the developing countries. Uh, no country should be complacent, no country should be uh, only focused on political rights to the disregard of uh, economic rights. The right to development is a cornerstone of political rights, I would say. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think, including China, we need to constantly improve our human rights record. That means human rights in China next year should be better than this year. And our record this year is much better than 40 years ago, that's for sure. So it's a moving uh, dynamics. We need to be mm -hmm. never be complacent about our achievements. And well, talking about moving dynamics, <coughs> Mr. Liu, mm -hmm. uh, how does China's uh, big push to build a country, uh, ru a rule of law in the country, uh, can play a part in this? Yes, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, my personal understanding is uh, for a modern China, we uh, have a new approach. The, this approach is, uh, uh, I say, uh, three uh, dimensions. Mm. Uh, uh, development, uh, rule of law, and human rights. So uh, three of them uh, combined together. Mm. And uh, for rule of law, which so it, uh, they don't come in order. You just mentioned three. So yeah, yeah, it's not equally exactly important. In, in hierarchy. Yeah, mm. I see. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, try to uh, uh, promote rule of law comprehensively, and how to evaluate uh, rule of law, or how to evaluate uh, the legislation and uh, uh, human rights uh, are the one of the standards. Mm. And uh, how to evaluate the development. So uh, human being oriented uh, uh, development, uh, that's a good uh, sustainable uh, development. And uh, what are good uh, human rights promotion? It's uh, the, 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 the uh, human rights cause promoted by rule of law and uh, based upon uh, good development. And Edward, you've been practicing law in China for sure. decades, so how important is this idea of rule of law uh, to benefit individuals? No, absolutely paramount, but I think if people don't understand the infrastructure, it's just been 30 years that there's been you know, lawyers that have been taking the bar examination, for example. So we have 300,000 lawyers in China, we have a country of 1.4 billion people, we have 1.3 million in the United States, five times less the population. So just the infrastructure, even if they wanted to do it all tomorrow, where everyone had access to a lawyer, it wouldn't be really feasible. So there's now as many law programs in China as we have in the United States, and so I think that rule of law is important, but you can't make it happen overnight because you need to have the practitioners or people who've attended law school and graduated people like Victor. As human rights, it's a gradual process. Sure. Thank you very much, gentlemen, Thank for you. our input. And that's it for this edition of Dialogue on CGTN. I'm Pandong in Beijing. Bye-bye.